bringing you the latest in tax credit news, this is Tax Credit Tuesday with your host, Michael Novogratik. Hello, I'm Michael Novogratik, and this is Tax Credit Tuesday. This is the May 23, 2023 podcast. Last week, HUD released income limits for 2023. These are the limit that determine eligibility for HUD-assisted programs and low housing tax credit finance properties. The 2023 limits were significantly lower than many affordable housing stakeholders had expected. These limits also are used to determine the maximum rents for low income housing tax credit properties. At Novogratik, we spend a fair amount of time thinking about and forecasting income limits. This year's limits release was a little bit of a mystery since it wasn't entirely clear what data HUD would use in its calculations. In recent pre-pandemic years, income limits have been based on American Community Survey data from three years earlier, adjusted by the Consumer Price Index. However, as we've discussed on many previous episodes of this podcast, the COVID-19 pandemic created significant data collection issues for the Census Bureau for the year 2020. Issues so severe that the Census Bureau didn't release data, such that HUD didn't have that data to use for the year 2020. Now, the question of how exactly HUD would determine the 2023 numbers brought considerably more uncertainty to this year's figures. Now, last year, HUD did state that they would use 2021 ACS data since 2020 data wasn't available. They also announced that using the more current, the 2021 data, doesn't seem that much more current, but it is more current than 2020, meant they would miss their traditional April 1 income limits release date, or at least target release date, and they targeted May 15th, a target that they did hit. Now, in addition to the uncertainty as to the methodology for determining income limits, there was also uncertainty as to how the income limits percentage cap would be determined. Ultimately, HUD decided to calculate this year's cap, the 2023 percentage cap, based on the annualized change in American Community Survey data from 2019 to 2021. Now, before last year, the percentage cap was based on twice the percentage increase in national median income. Last year, a limit based on that calculation would have been a cap of about 25%. However, as many listeners know, last year HUD changed the methodology for setting the cap to twice the percentage increase in 2019 ACES data over 2018. This yielded a much lower cap of just under 12%. Now, last year's change in cap methodology and questions about the 2023 cap was the subject of considerable discussion among members of the Novogratic Income Limits Working Group. There was much discussion because it was unclear if HUD would return to the pre-pandemic approach of determining the cap based on annual change in national media income, which would have been about a 14% increase, 12 to 14%, or would HUD continue to use the methodology for determining the cap based on year-over-year change in ECS data? Well, as I already noted, HUD decided to use the year-over-year change in ECS data, that is the 2021 over 2019 increase. The result of all of this is that generally speaking, the cap is now slightly less than 6%, 5.92% to be exact. What does this mean? Well, it means that the maximum household income for a family to qualify for horrible housing that's subject to these limits can only go up a maximum of 5.92% from the year before, generally speaking. And the cap also generally means increases in rent for long term tax credit properties cannot exceed 5.92%. Now, this limit on rent increases is a clear benefit to existing tenants. But for prospective tenants, the lower income levels means that fewer lower income families will qualify to occupy vacant units. The lower rent levels will also likely cause some financial stress for many tax credit properties. Our listeners know that the rate of inflation has been quite high, and in 2022, it was about 8%, which means that nearly all local housing tax credit properties saw notable year-over-year increases in operating expenses. Many property owners were expecting higher rent increases in 2023 to help cover much higher operating costs. Now that we know the income limits, we also know that about 85%, yes, 85% of areas in the United States will be limited by this. 5.92% 5.92% cap. I'll note that last year, roughly 50% of areas were limited by the cap. There's a lot involved in the calculation of the income limits and what that means both for 2023 and going forward. This applies to both tenants and those who operate 
and build affordable housing properties. Now, the good news is we have an expert with us today. It's Thomas Dagg, my partner in Novogratz Metro Seattle office, who may know more about income limits than anyone outside of HUD. Thomas has been the guest on this podcast several previous times to discuss income limits, and I'm certainly very pleased to have him back, and I know that you, our listener, are as well. In his work at Novogratic, Thomas specializes in auditing tax services for real estate transactions, particularly concerning affordable housing. Thomas has been an editor for several of our handbooks. He writes for the Novak Journal of Tax Credits and speaks at our webinars and conferences, including an upcoming webinar on, you guessed it, income limits. Suffice it to say, there's no one more qualified than Thomas to discuss income limits and the ramifications of this year's limits. Now, in today's episode, Thomas and I will talk about the main takeaways from last week's announcement and what the lower than expected cap means to tenants and property owners. After that, we'll discuss what we know and what we know we don't know. Unfortunately, we can't discuss what we don't know we don't know, <laughs> but rest assured there are some of those items out there as well. But we're discussing what we know and what we know we don't know concerning income limits for 2024 and beyond. This is an important topic and we have a lot we're going to cover. So if you're ready, let's get started. Thomas, welcome back to Task Credit Tuesday. Thanks, Mike. Good to be here. Well, I certainly wasn't sure if we would be recording this right now because I wasn't sure if HUD would meet their May 15th deadline that they had set for themselves or target release date. Uh, last year, they were roughly three weeks late, if I remember correctly, from the April 1 deadline. Uh, but they did. So I'm glad that we can have this uh, podcast today and that you can discuss what the income limits are going to mean. So I'll start at a very wide view. What are the main takeaways that you have from last week's income limits release? Yeah. So let's start with the good news first, because I feel like we're going to delve into the cap and maybe leave a little bit with not great news, but good news first. If we look at unique areas, only 54 areas had a decrease this year. That's less than 2% of the areas across the country. So 98% of the areas are up. That means that we're going to have increased income limits so more tenants can qualify, increased rent limits so we can continue to cover our increasing operating expenses. So all in all, it's good news. In fact, the average increase was 5.45%. And as we look across the country, some years we have this divide in increases between metro and non-metro. And we didn't really see that this year. In fact, non-metro actually increased a little bit faster at 5.47%. And uh, metro was just slightly below 5.4%. So no big change between uh, a rural area and a non-metro area, at least that's how HUD defines them. And so it's kind of good news all across the country. There's not some areas that were uh, kind of down and others were up. Pretty much everybody's up across the country. And we see that in our national median income figure that went from $90,000 last year to $96,200, a 6.88% increase. Um, as we'll talk about the cap, it's interesting that you would kind of scratch your head and say, Thomas, how did the national median income go up by 6.8%, but the average increase is only 5.45? And that's because of this interplay of the cap that we're going to spend a lot of time talking about. So I won't uh, get too far into that now, but that is the real story. After we strip all this good news and kind of dig into it a little bit more, yeah. we start Stop. to look at, at this cap. And the cap this year, as you mentioned a few times, was 5.92%. And over 85% of the areas were capped. And so this cap was a big surprise to people, although there were some inklings that this might be it. Um, but beyond the cap, everything was as ex expected. If we look at the increases, we look at the CPI factors that were used, HUD kind of struck to the, stuck to the script. So let's dig a little bit more on that question that I know many of our listeners have, and it deals with the cap. And I appreciate you sharing all the good news because it is important to us point out what you did in terms of 98% of the areas having increases and the like. But we discussed within the working group that there would be a cap of between 12 and 14% that the national median income approach was used, or it'd be about 6% if the year-over-year -year ACS data methodology was used. Uh, and as we've said many times, we know that the cap is now just under 6% at 5.92%. Maybe you could expand a little bit more on what this means and how you think I got to this approach. Yeah, so I think we have to start by talking about the historical method and how it changed. 
The cap used to be based on the change in national median income as published by HUD, which I mentioned was $96,200 this year, up 6.8%. And inside that national median income that's published, it takes into account all the inflation factors and other, well, really the inflation factor adjustment that HUD uses when they're calculating area median income. So it really makes that cap kind of compare apples to apples with our income limit calculation. And so the cap always kind of made sense for comparing current year national median income to current year incomes. But under the new method of the cap, they're looking at the underlying ACS data, which as we know is this trilling data. And so this year's cap, we're looking at 2019 and 2021. And basically the cap is the annualized change between those two benchmarks. And you know, if we kind of think about what's happening in our economy and world right now, it's very different than what was happening in 2020. And so because of that, we kind of end up with a little bit of a, in my opinion, a disconnect between the cap methodology and the income limits that we're applying that cap to. And, you know, we look at what happened last year and it kind of makes sense. There was this pandemic and the cap would have been 25%. It just kind of seemed out of line with what was happening. And so it makes sense that HUD would have kind of uh, played that a little bit, but we were hoping that this was kind of a one-time adjustment due to, you know, this extraordinary increase. Uh, but unfortunately, that new methodology did continue forward. And so now we're in this environment where we have a disconnect between the timing when the cap is calculated, which is basically three-year-old data, and the income limits that we're using today, which granted are based on three-year-old data, but are trended forward, taking into account the inflation factors. Great. So thank you for that. And I'm going to stay on the cap for a little bit here. <laughs> Since that's a question we're getting from most of our clients is uh, what the impact of the cap is and what it means. So I've, you know, explained that roughly 85% of the areas will be subject uh, to the cap. And I said, generally speaking, <laughs> it would be subject to the cap. So maybe you could explain to our listeners with a little more depth and kind of uh, give a more granularity to my 85% are going to be subject to the cap and why I said, generally speaking. Yeah. So first, let's talk about what the cap means. I'm going to use Sarasota, Florida as our example. Uh, Mantatee County, because it, it was the county that jumped out to me when I was looking at this. And so that county was capped at 45700 this year. But without the cap, the income limits would have increased to 49350 So we know the cap increase was right around 6.92%. And we know that... Uh, and the uncapped increase would have been around 13, 14% for this area. And so that cap lowers that income limit for qualifying. So a tenant that's making above 45,000, but less than 49,000 wouldn't qualify for housing this area. So that's what the cap does is lowers it. And it also lowers the rent, which as you touched on, it's good news for existing tenants, but not great news for property owners and not good news for these prospective tenants. But what's interesting is this cap applies to, you know, the HUD published very low income limit, but it doesn't apply to here are special income limits. And now I don't want to do a deep dive into all the history behind here are special, but here are specials available to projects located in certain areas that are placed in service in 2009 or earlier. So those areas, they're, if you're a here are special project and HUD publishes the here are special income limits. So you don't worry, have to worry about calculating this yourself or going out and, and checking these figures. HUD's going to publish it, and it will be an uncapped amount. Um, I didn't check. I should have. I didn't check if Sarasota was a here a special area. But if it were, um, kind of said her fair of it, then the here a special income limit for Sarasota, Florida would be that 49350 number. And your rents would also be based on that. So if you're here a special, it's uncapped. And kind of an interesting uh, outcome of this potentially is we might have projects or looking at resyndicating that might pump the brakes on that a little bit because they say, wait, so you're telling me if I go out and rehab this project, spend X million of dollars making this project nicer, my income and rent limits are now going to decrease because I'm no longer able to use here a special. So that's kind of this additional interesting kind of uh, unattended consequence of the cap. So think of that. And I would also just note that if you're a property under development, I know we have lots of clients that have 
properties that are development and they're trying to project what the income levels are likely to be. There's definitely been some surprises, uh, with the number of developers who are now looking at their developments and seeing that their rents will be, uh, notably less, uh, than they were expecting them to be if the, uh, national median income percentage change had been used as a consequence, they'll have less net operating income projected, they'll have lower per loan, low bit of financing gap. And at a time of rising costs, rising operating expenses and arrest, that's a very uh, unfortunate outcome for them. But more, more about that in a future podcast. So I do find it interesting that 85% of the areas are cap, and that is a large number being subject to the cap. Now, last year it was 50% of areas being subject to the cap. Maybe you could share with listeners historically. If we go back more than two years, what percentage of areas traditionally have been sub to a cap? Yeah. And so this, these last two years of 50% and 85% are definitely outliers. And we used to look at the cap as being structured as, you know, two times that change in national median income. If you figure that's your median, anybody that's double that is going to be an outlier. And so traditionally we've seen between five to 15% of the areas cap kind of depending on where the cap was in any given year. And to have such a high percentage cap means that the cap, in, in my opinion, and I went back and reread kind of the guidance when the cap came out, and this was not one of their stated objectives, but I, I've always viewed the cap as trying to catch the outliers to make sure we're not seeing kind of rapid growth in, in a few areas and catch those and make it more kind of predictable in line with the rest. But now the cap is capturing 85% of the areas. The non-capped areas are now the outliers as opposed to the capped area. So it's kind of in this shift, especially this year on the percentage of areas that are capped. And to what extent do you think that the reason why 85% of the areas are capped is a tribunal to recent high rates of inflation not being captured in the year over year ACS data change? Yeah, right. Cause we're still looking at this ACS data from 2019 and 2021. So realistically, if you say it's the growth from 19 to 2021, that's still kind of mid-pandemic. 2021, if I remember correctly, I feel like years last decades now, but 2021 feels like that's when the inflation really started to hit. And where we saw it start to hit at the uh, income levels, right? So 2020, we were really worried about people getting laid off, people losing their jobs. And then in 2021, it seems that's when we started to bounce back a little bit. And 2022 was really when I, I think that the inflation took off and wages, there's much more wage pressure in 2022. And so we're using kind of this data from, you know, the three years that I wouldn't want to use for any data, but that's besides the point, right? Because it's just COVID data, it's pandemic, all that fun stuff. But I think we just kind of have this timing difference right now between when we're basing the cap on and what's actually been happening in 22 and 23. No, it definitely means that kind of this working group has a lot more work to do <laughs> in terms yeah. of trying to assess, you know, what 2024 is going to look like, but let's hold off on that. I'll come back to 2024 and beyond. Going to be getting back to I'm a property owner and uh, I have this cap kicking in. I want to be the 85% of the areas that had this in subject to the cap. And what does that mean to the property going forward? Question that I know you and I get from many, uh, clients is does the fact that I'm cap in some way, allow me to bank future increases in qualified income levels and rents? Yeah. So the, the question is, it's not necessarily banked, but it's a good omen that you have increases in the future. So let's stick with our Sarasota example here. And the uncapped amount is 49,350. So there is no guarantee next year that you'll get to 49,350. This is not something that's in the savings account and you'll get to it regardless. So it's not really banked, but even if all the underlying data just remained flat and nothing changed, then you would get to that level. You'd go to 49,350 subject to the cap, right? If the cap next year is... 5%, maybe you wouldn't get all the way to 49,350. But subject to the cap, as long as the underlying data continues to increase, we know that you're going to get at least to that amount. But if you're in an area or 
as uh, inflation slows down, if wages don't keep up with the inflation judgment, uh, adjustments we've had, then maybe next year when HUD comes and does their calculation, oh, they do their calculation, turns out it's $48,000 next year. You'll never get up to this 49350 You'll only go up to what's calculated next year. And so I always say this is a good omen and maybe a tailwind to income limit increase, but it's definitely not a guarantee. And the other thing you have to understand is how big your gap. What were you capped at? Would you have been a 6% increase, but for the 5.92% increase? Okay, well, I don't know what's going to happen to you next year. If you would have been a 30% increase, but for the 6.92% increase, well, then I think that I feel pretty comfortable saying you're going to have a fairly robust increase next year as well. Right. Thank you for that. And I think a few times you might have said 6.92 instead of 5.92. Oh, but sorry. Listeners Which full 5.92 or 6%, and sometimes it's yeah. Put it together, but uh, I think we all know we've said 5.92% or nearly 6% of the times that it puts it yeah. available in the minds. Um, so, so, so it's not really banked, and that's an important point. It's, 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 I guess it's, a, I think of it as a good starting point. <laughs> right. Uh, in the sense that you're starting at a higher number of the levels. Simply, the only way you will get it is if it travels all in your area year over year. Um, but, it, you know, at a minimum, it's a good starting place in terms of uh, income potentially declining. And of course, we're, you know, now next year, presumably we'll be looking at 2022 data uh, or not. We could be looking at 2021. We'll talk about that in a bit. So maybe revert back to, okay, I now know it hasn't been banged, but it's a good starting point. Uh, but if I'm an owner or an operator, what should I be doing now with this uh, information? Yeah, yeah, great. So we're going to talk about 2024 and beyond in a second, but right now let's talk about what's in front of us, 2023. And I think the the first answer is for income limit increases, we always want to admit those ASAP so that we can start qualifying additional tenants, right? As the limits go up, more families can qualify. If you're having a hard time leasing up, this might help you qualify that one family you didn't qualify a week ago. So income limit increases, let's implement right away. Income limit decreases, well, you're held harmless. If you're in one of those 54 counties, I think I said it was, uh, you know, you're held harmless if you're in service. So we don't need to get too worried about income limit in decreases. We're just going to be held harmless. Uh, but your rent increases, that's where we talk about being a little bit more delicate, right? We want to look at your market, look at your operating cost and say, you know, have we done big increases the last few years? Is now the right time to do increases? Is it needed for this project? And so, you know, we always advise on the rent increases, be much more kind of thoughtful and considerate about your market, your tenant population and what's happening. And so that's on existing projects, but on new projects, uh, especially ones that um, have not placed in service yet, typically we say we want to, you're going to want to implement these increases at that initial lease up so that you're able to support additional debt probably cover some of your cost overruns. Uh, and I, should, I shouldn't say support additional debt in this interest rate environment, uh, support uh, probably still less debt than you underwrote, but more debt than you otherwise would be able to. And so these are going to be very helpful for those projects that are in construction, having this uh, nice tailwind of income limit increases. So thank you for that. Uh, it is interesting. I have to go back and look at the podcast as when we first started talking about 2023 income limits, <laughs> but it was a long time going back to the point when we learned that the census bureau would not be publishing 2020 ACS data. So back yeah. when that, we knew that since the census bureau wouldn't be publishing 2020 ACS data, we knew that had to, have to develop an alternative approach for determining income limits of 2023. And we spent a lot of time talking about the 2023 income limits now that they are out uh, as a hinted at in prior questions and prior discussion points, looking at 2024 and beyond, you know, what do we know now about 2024 and beyond? So I thought it'd be useful if you could describe some of what we do, what you think we know about 2024 income calculations and perhaps more importantly, what we know, we don't know about 2024 income calculations. And of course, as I mentioned in the introduction, there are things we don't know that we don't know about 2024 20, income calculations. And I wish we could find a way to talk about those, <laughs> but since we don't know them, we can't really talk about them. We just know 
beyond what we know and what we know we don't know that'll be surprises. Maybe you could just talk about what we know, what we don't know about 2024 income calculation. Yeah. So the one thing I do know that we know is that HUD will publish income limits for 2024 <laughs> and they will be different than this year. But I think it's kind of more interesting to talk about what we need to know in order to understand what, what they're going to look like. So right now, it would appear that HUD has two choices in calculating the income limits. Use the 2021 ACS data again, or use the 2022 ACS data. And you might look at me and say, well, Thomas, it's obvious they wouldn't use the same ACS data again. That would just be kind of uh, ridiculous. We just have the same income limits two years in a row. And the answer to that is, uh, number one, no, we wouldn't have the same income limits. First off, we'd use a different CPI factor. So we know there'd be some underlying changes there. And also we have all these caps that would be maybe uh, come into play if they use the same in ACS data again. And you say, okay, that was fine. It, we'd have different number, but they would never do that. But HUD has done this before. In 2012, because HUD changed their release date from first quarter of the year to December of the year, they didn't have enough time to get the new ACS data. And they actually used the same ACS data for 2011 and 2012. What's interesting, if you look at the map from that year of our changes in income limits, it's not what you'd expect that all areas change the same because HUD has various adjustments that they make that will be new numbers. The high housing cost adjustment that's based on fair market rents will have new fair market rent data that, that informs that. The unwinding of the cap for various areas will have data that impacts that. And so if HUD I think it, there's a very realistic chance that HUD may choose to use the 2021 ACS data again. And the reason why I say that is using the 2022 data really constricts their timeline to get this done. And they have a lot of other things that they need to do. And so they, they, they shifted for the benefit of the industry this year, they shifted their whole schedule to be able to use the 2020 ACS data, which again is a good answer and it's good out come that we have an increase, average increase of 5.45 compared to what we talked to. So HUD, HUD did good work this year. I don't want us, people to go away saying, oh man, we just bad mouth HUD because of the cap. We maybe, I personally, I'm not a huge fan of the cap methodology, but I think HUD has done a great job of calculating limits and did a great job of adapting to their lack of data. But asking them to do that next year and then every year going forward, I don't know if they're ready to make that change. And that's the biggest question we have for HUD right now is what are you planning to do? And I don't think HUD even knows that yet because right now they just released 2023. The ink's not even dry yet. And now they're kind of moving forward to 2023 fair market rents that are due um, end of August. Uh, yeah, end of, I can't remember if it's end of August or in September right now. You can edit in the correct answer. Uh, I'll tweet out the correct answer. That's perfect. And so... I'm pretty sure it's end of August. Uh, and so we have these fair market rents that are coming that they've shifted to calculating. And so HUD doesn't really have time right now to give us an answer on this question. And I'm sure that what they're doing with the 2023 fair market rents will give us some breadcrumbs as to what the answer is going to be. So the biggest question right now is, you know, what's going to be our base number? And so as many of you know, we do income limit estimates where we take the American Community Survey data and trend it out using CPI. So for our 2024 estimates, we are still using 2021 data. And part of that is because 2022 data is not out till September. And so we don't have the 2022 data to do some comparisons with yet. And so we like to be able to build it off of something. And so we're building off of 2021. In fact, we're kind of updating right now for the new CAP methodology. So for our updated 2024 estimates, we're going to assume that we're using 2021 ACS. Or we're going to assume that the cap's going to be the same because I've talked about there's going to be a lot of changes to what that final answer is, but the factors will remain the same. That ACS data has not changed. And so we'll leave the cap the same at this 5.92%, but we will be updating and for areas that would otherwise have a smaller increase, we're going to chew into this cap and things like that. So we're updating this calculation so that people can start to get a feel of saying, well, if HUD does use 2021, where do we end up? And then as soon as HUD gives us an answer as to what they're going to use, then we'll either say, great, our estimates are, are great, or we'll say, well, here's our new estimates based on 2022. Um, and as we always say, the estimates are based on the best information we have right now, right? 
and they're much better than taking the average of the last 20 years like we used to do. Um, and so we're, we're looking at that. And then, you know, the other thing that I think we know is, well, the other unknown actually is with the CPI factor, there's talk that maybe the CPI factor should be shifted to something, to a PPI factor. And how does that play into it? So, you know, 2024, again, is going to be a year that we have a lot of unknowns. But we know that September is going to be critical because September will have the fair market rents for 2023. So we can start looking at those and how they calculate and what ACS data they use there because we had the same ACS data issues with fair market rents. Plus, we'll have the 2022 ACS. And we'll be able to see and say, well, if 2022 ACS continue to go up, and we'll say, well, 2021, based on 2021, is our worst case answer. They use 2022, we're going to be better. And that might also inform what sort of lobbying we want to do as an industry to say, how did you listen to us in 2023 and came up with a great answer of using 2021? We think it's good for the industry if we, can, if we continue to use this timeline. But again, if we use the, the more recent ACS, we know that's going to push out the delivery date. And maybe it won't be May 15th. They say this is going to be the new normal. Maybe it's June 15th because they say, hey, we can get overtime approved or whatever for one year, but we can't get approved as standard operating procedure. Right. So there's going to be some trade offs depending on what they do here. So that's a good point about the fact that if they use 2021 data, you would think they could go back to the April 1 targeted release date. But if they use 2022 ACS, then that gets pushed out and maybe gets pushed out beyond May 15th. And it'll be interesting to see within the Ecolums working group what the general thinking is as to if they, if they got to choose, not that they get to choose. <laughs> But they right. got to choose, or they prefer April 1 with 2021 or some number beats that bad for months by uh, using uh, 2022. And I think it's good that you pointed out the CPI adjustment factor and what extent that could uh, change. And then, of course, is the, yeah, is this year over year cap methodology the new normal? Or the, I should say the right. next normal. Because yeah. the, these aren't set in stone. There's, there's always a next normal. Uh, right. There's a, a change that gets changed periodically. Uh, so we've covered a lot of ground today about the 2023 income limits, uh, as well as touched upon 2024 and 2025. Uh, could you share with our listeners the various no gut resources available to them? as they look to implement these limits at their existing properties, as well as they consider what income limits might look like in 2024 and 2025. Yeah, so most listeners should know this by now, that our rent income limit calculator was updated and released in beta. Uh, in it, what we call a beta release, right? Because we've tested it. We don't usually find bugs, but we just want you to know that, you know, it's more likely that there might be something wrong in the first couple of weeks while we're still continuing to test it, but people want it as soon as possible. So we released that on Thursday of last week. And so hopefully people have gone on and started using that. And so that's number one, the rent income limit calculator. Then the rent income limit or the income limit working group, I can't stress this enough, the amount of uh, kind of thought and effort that goes into that working group and the great result we got this year with uh, the convincing HUD not to use the 2025 year data. And I'm not going to say we convinced them, but I definitely think we helped further that conversation. And the income limit group, as you mentioned, Mike, has a lot of goals for this year as we talk with HUD and not just on understanding what CPI they're going to use and those sort of things, but also working with the IRS on various hold harmless policies and things like that. So the income limits working group, and we're really working on what, what fact impacts our projects the most in some ways is our income and rent limits. So it's a great working group. HUD's going to come talk to our group next week to kind of give us a rundown of the limits. They've indicated that they're willing to do a listening session this later this year as we kind of tell them what our thoughts are and what they should do with 2024. And so, you know, I think that working group is a, a great benefit to the industry and those who, the members who join it, get a lot, lot of good, deep information. And then finally, we'll have our webinar at the end of this month. I think it's actually the first of next month, June 2nd. And so... I look forward to joining you there. I'll be talking about that and you'll be able to actually follow along with visuals this time, uh, which I think goes a long ways with income limits. And of course you found this podcast. So we have the podcast that you should send to your friends who are wondering about the cap as well. And then if you're worried about your specific areas, income limits, 
know, subject to those caveats I talked about earlier, you know, you can purchase estimates for your area and kind of help you get some informed decisions as to what we think we know about income limits for your specific area right now. When we talk about the estimates, you mentioned that, you know, the firm market rent calculations will come out and firm market rent levels will come out and then we'll end up getting the 2022 ACS data. And there's periodically changes in uh, the CPI number that gets published by the CDO. When someone's purchasing an estimate in a given area, how does that work from a pricing perspective in terms of a one-time estimate versus a subscription base? Can you describe yeah. So we have, as you mentioned, a one-time estimate or a point in time, as we call it, or a subscription. So the point in time, you get it based on what we know now, 2021 ACS, 5.92% cap, then we're going to run with your area. But if you buy the subscription, every time we get either an, a CPI update or we get more information from HUD, or if you're an area that's impacted, that's you know on that cusp where sometimes you're impacted by FMRs and sometimes you're not. If FMRs come out and they impact your area, you get an automatic update. So it's this push update. And realistically, if you buy now, you're probably guaranteed to get at least three updates, uh, but the price isn't even quite double when you buy the subscription. And so if you're looking at 2024, and I'm not gonna do a hard sales pitch here because I think it, it sells itself, but if you're looking at 2024, uh, you know, buying that subscription I think is critical because we know there's gonna be updates. And in a normal, in some years, in years with, stable inflation and nothing going with HUD, our income limits may be changed by $50 at the 50% level for the course of the year uh, because inflation changes a tiny bit. But this year, we know that because there's unknowns coming into adding more uh, variability to our calculation, that it's good to kind of have that subscription so that you're getting these updates as we know the changes. Yeah, I would just note to our listeners that you know, if you're, if you have properties under development, you really need this subscription so you can be updating your, uh, income levels at various stages during the, uh, underwriting phase during the, when, when you're applying for your credits and over the, his, over the course of the development period, uh, it's nice to know how your income levels are projected to be changing. So you'll know, so you can better anticipate. <laughs> potential shortfalls uh, in permanent loan financing or additional revenue that maybe could increase the size of your a permanent loan as you're dealing with financing gaps. Because we definitely, you don't, you don't see oversourced developments these days. You see uh, developments that are in the course of the evolvement phase become slightly undersourced uh, and have to find ways to close financing gaps. Yeah. And Mike, I would say on the other side of that as well is we're seeing um, many more kind of investor groups, syndicators, and uh, large uh, lenders buying our estimates as well so that they can be informed. <laughs> I just, you know, I just committed these loans to all these projects. Was that a smart choice? What's happening in the future? Are things changing? And so we're seeing that our user base has really expanded. At first, it was just kind of these core developers. And now it's the lenders, it's the investors that also are looking at this to help inform their investment decisions. Again, this is one tool, right? One piece of that puzzle, but it's a good bit of information to have as you're evaluating these things. I'm glad that you mentioned that because I've discussed that with many syndicators and lenders uh, and the like about uh, purchasing these uh, at the subscription base for various, either the full, uh, you know, if they have enough properties, just have an overall subscription to the, all the income limits or uh, certain areas and critical to uh, underwriting as they're assessing, as they're making their equity advances and such to the development to try to help identify, help the developer identify potential gaps coming and, you know, financing options. Uh, anything else you want to say on resources? That's a lot. <laughs> I, I think the other thing I would say is we have a lot of blog posts on this and, uh, you can go back and read the history. If you look up the income limits for 2022, we have six paragraphs on the cap and examples in there. And so, you know, look for the blog post as well if you want to get kind of caught up to speed. Great. Thank you for that, Thomas. I will share links to all of uh, these resources in today's show notes. I want to say, Thomas, thank you for joining me today and addressing a topic that always gets a lot of attention uh, in the affordable housing community. I will share Thomas's email address in the show notes.
So if you have any questions about income limits, please reach out to Thomas. You can also email me at cpas at novaco.com. Uh, to our listeners, uh, please turn into next week's podcast where my partner, George Barlow from our Dover, Ohio office is going to join me to talk about the use of new market tax credits to help finance for sale housing. That's right. You heard that correctly. Using new markets tax credits to help build for sale housing. George has been working in that area for virtually his entire career. And on the podcast next week, we'll talk about the requirements to do so and where that use of a community development tax incentive is taking place in an effort to, de- to address America's housing shortage. If you're a developer, community development entity, an investor, anyone else in the new market tax world or the housing world more broadly, you'll want to tune in. If you have any questions that you think we should cover during that podcast, please email me at cpas at novaco.com. So now I'm pleased to reach our off mic section where I get to ask Thomas for some fun off topic recommendations and words of wisdom. And I won't talk about your running goals, but, uh, but maybe you're going to, they're going to, you're going to weave those into some of your answers. Uh, but the first question, I don't think I've asked you before, and I pardon if I have, you've done a lot of podcasts, uh, what's your best time management tip? Yeah. So it's funny. So I was talking to my, uh, daughter about this podcast and I was, uh, when I was working on the script and I told her, oh, Mike wants to ask me this. And she's like, you seem pretty busy. I'm not sure you're the guy you should be asking this. You should just <laughs> tell him about your cats and stuff. So it, in honor of my daughter, I'm not going to answer your question. I'm going to tell you about our cats instead. So. Okay. Tell me about your cats. She'll probably never listen. I said, you should listen to my podcast. She said, well, I want to listen to an accounting podcast. I, and I couldn't help but say that's a fair point. Uh, so we have two cats. One's a 25 pound Maine Coon that's very fluffy. And his name is Pebble, who was named by my daughter because she thought it'd be funny to have a gray cat that looks like a ginormous rock named Pebble. And then we have a 15 year old Siamese cat that was rescued from inside the wall of a bathroom. It somehow fell inside a wall when it was a kitten and it meowed till the owner ripped open the wall and rescued him. And he does not know that he's a cat or really what a cat is because he uh, was rescued from a bathroom wall as a kitten. And so He's a very interesting cat, and you can ask me for Simon stories at some point if you'd like. Probably not in the off-mic section. That's probably a better cocktail hour dialogue. <laughs> so I, I've now officially hijacked the off-mic session. I was hoping I could have a first here where I was the first person to not answer your question. Well, that's good. I think you are the first, uh, but uh, I'm sure the cats fit into how you uh, manage your time in some way. Uh, and it's interesting that you're a cat, leave a cat named Pebble. Because I have a dog named Pebbles. Oh, interesting. So, on to my next question that you probably won't answer either. Maybe like <laughs> dogs <laughs> or your chickens or some other animals at your home. Uh, but I know that you're busy, particularly right now with the income limits coming out and all the rest. Uh, if you could share with our listeners a tip or two and how you're able to keep the main thing, the main thing uh, when you're busy. And when you have so many things competing for your time, how do you keep your focus? Yeah. So I think for me, the big part is scheduling it. And so I need to schedule, when am I going to be working? When am I going to be assisting my family? When am I going to be at the little league baseball game or whatever it may be, but it's all about kind of scheduling that. Cause if you don't schedule in the outside of work stuff, work will just creep everywhere in my experience. Um, you know, often during tax season, I'll find it's 10 o'clock at night and I haven't eaten lunch even because I've just been so focused on it. And so just uh, having that discipline to schedule and stick to that schedule and not letting work erode everything else is uh, kind of the key for me. And some days I'm successful, some days I'm not. But for the most part, keeping that nice schedule helps me. Great. Thank you for those uh, tips. And I know you're uh, heading off to be with your uh, son, I believe you said, uh, after the podcast. So I appreciate you uh, scheduling in the podcast and I appreciate your scheduling the time with your son. Yeah. Thanks. So, it's always thank a pleasure. You. Thank you, Thomas. And to our listeners, I'm Mike Novogratik. Thanks for listening. This weekly podcast has been brought to you by Novogratik and Company LLP. 
Archived podcasts are available online at www.novaco.com slash podcast or by subscribing to the Tax Credit Tuesday podcast in iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and Radio Public. You can find related links referenced in this podcast on our website at www.novaco.com slash podcast. Novogratic and Company LLP is a national certified public accounting and consulting firm with offices nationwide. Learn more about our professional services at www.novaco.com.